So a moderator in the, in the United Church, I never, I never dreamed. Uh, so I'd just like to thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see familiar faces and nice to see people live and in color. Um, so I'm just going to sing a little song that I thought might be vaguely appropriate. It's called uh, Hometown. I wrote it a little while back and here it goes. streets are looking kind of dusty. Where is the rain? And the water tower's looking rusty. Ain't that a shame? Seems the old damn world is changing right before you rise. Still there's always something here you're gonna recognize. In a hometown in your own town, it's a place you'd like to stay, a memory away, hometown. All the yarns look a little faded out in the sun, and the billboard's getting kind of dated, you know the one. Seems the whole damn world is racing, we're standing still. But if you want to find a smiling face, you always will. In a hometown, in your own town, it's a place you'd like to stay. A melody away, hometown. Take a stroll down the sidewalk Hear the crickets sing a song Neighbors sitting on a porch swing And fireflies lighting up the lawn See the kids hanging on the corner all through July Waiting on a little entertainment like who's driving by. Seems the world keeps getting younger, we're just getting old. Still we've got a treasure here, it's shining bright as gold. In a hometown, it's your own town. There's a welcome mat and an open door. A sleeping bag rolled out on the floor. There's always room for just one more in my home town. It's always nice to see you back in my home town. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very kind. So I know most of you know more about Newburgh than I do. Um, but that, that said, I thought I would just give a little backdrop uh, as to the, the history of this great place, and it will start like this. The first European settlers came here, and anyone can feel free at any time to correct me, uh, came between 1820 and 1825, so it's pretty close to bang on 200 years ago. And the three names that uh, come to mind are David Perry, William Van Pelt Detler, and Benjamin Files. And Perry, I believe, built the, the first sawmill, 1824, followed that up uh, two years later by building a grist mill. Hi, Betty Ann. Hi, Grant. Um, the community was soon buzzing, uh, and there were, I believe, up to 13 mills uh, on a stretch of the river that was no longer than one third of a, of a mile long. So it, it, was, uh, it was hopping, and it 
it was called, well, an, an epithet was added to the common name of the, of the community, and the, that common name was uh, the hollow, uh, but the epithet was rogues. Uh, so we had rogues, hollow, and I, I see that rogue is defined as a dishonest or unprincipled man. So uh, here we had a village where the men were rugged rascals, and the women were virtuous and good-looking. So, and I see nothing, nothing much has changed in that. In that uh, so, but uh, not everyone really took kindly to the Rogue's Hollow moniker, and Cyrus Allison uh, was one. And he wrote in the, uh, in the Christian Guardian back in 1841 that the heathen name of this place was Rogue's Hollow. The Christian name is Newburg, and it is new in many respects. It was once drunken, it is now sober. It was once wicked, it is now, to a very great degree, reformed. I see even Cyrus had to qualify the last part by saying that it was just to a great degree reformed, so not entirely. Uh, when he wrote that in 1841, uh, there were 200 people living here in the new Newburgh. By 1857, some estimates go as high as 1,200 people. So that was uh, exponential <coughs> growth, growth. But shortly after the 1857 peak, uh, fortune stopped smiling quite as brightly on the, on the community. And there might be uh, three reasons for that. And the first one is that uh, I understand the initial plan for the Grand Trunk Railroad, which later uh, amalgamated into the CN line, uh, was supposed to go through Newburgh, the main line from Kingston to, to Toronto. But it turned out uh, in the end that it went several miles uh, south of Newburgh, so it missed us altogether and we didn't get uh, another railway for quite a number of years. Secondly, back in 1863, when the new county of Lennox and Addington was, was formed, uh, finally free of the yoke of uh, Frontenac County, which was making all the, all the decisions, uh, there were four communities in the running for the county seat. There, there, was, there was Bath, and there was Tamworth, and there was uh, Newburgh, and of course, the much despised Napanee. <laughs> um, and as we all know, Napanee got the nod. And I think at that time, 1863-64, one of the, the defining and deciding factors was that Napanee had water access to Lake Ontario and, and that commerce on the Great Lakes was a, a great uh, selling point for Napanee getting the, the county seat. Uh, and finally, as uh, most of us know, in uh, 1887, there was a terrible fire uh, in, in the town and it destroyed 84 buildings. And uh, I just uh, recently read that, um, that the reason that the rest of the village was saved was due in part uh, to the arrival of a, a fire engine from Napanee that came on, on a train. So that was uh, thanks to Napanee, and I take back all the bad things I said about them. Um, so from 1900 on, the, the, the population seemed to level out around 700, and I don't know where we're at today. It's probably a bit north of that, right? I don't know. But um, speaking of fire departments and saving the day, I, I would like to have our guests maybe introduce themselves and just say, uh, Ben, can you just say, say your name and where you were born? You got me, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ben Sutton. I uh, was born and raised up on the corner of Academy and, and Main Street, the house where my son lives now. And uh, I've been in Newburgh ever since. And then my spiel tonight was to 
be on probably the fire department because when it started, and David, you want me to continue you on? You continue. I'll just make a screwdriver adjustment over here. And do this. Here we go. Thanks, man. So just, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the, the fire department, uh, per se, has been part of my life. And I have a little plaque here with the boys gave me for 49 years of service, which apparently I, I didn't understand this, but I guess 50 years is, is the max, but uh, I didn't make 50. The reason being I was too young when I started, and I was probably one of the ones that said, hey, you know, we don't want any old codgers on this fire department. We want young people. So let's cut it off at age 65. Well, I cut myself short by a year, but that's here and right there. I, I started off with the academy, a very learned building on the hill, and it was built approximately in the middle of the, 18th, the 1800s. And it burned within probably 10 or 12 years of being built and would rebuild. And that sort of started me with the idea of a lot of things of importance went up in smoke in Newburgh. So after that, we moved down through the village and the first fire, I was about nine years old and one of my school chums, uh, Walter Hurd, who lives up on Church Street here on the corner, his house burned, and that really shook me. I, I never got over that, I don't think, because I had played in that house and played with toys that he had and that he no longer had. And that was probably around 1940, in that era. And everything was sort of downhill from there with, with housing fires, uh, 40, probably 45, Peter Fairburn house burned halfway up Newburgh Hill. In 47, the Mike Cairns barn burned on top of the hill. The cheese factory burned in 47. We had a lot of disastrous fires and we didn't have the equipment or the wherewith to buy the equipment. So something had to be done and Vernon Simpkins took over and he decided that we should have a fire department and he got together and they had meetings, one of which I went to on my bicycle down to the town hall, listened to their spiel and I come out and signed up as a fireman. They probably had about 16 of us at that time and that would have been 1947 May which comes up to 75 years, which is quite a, quite a feat right now. And everything was hunky-dory. We didn't have much equipment. We, we even signed a note that we would pay, each of us, 16 guys, would pay $200 toward a fire, piece of fire apparatus out of Toronto, army surplus which we did. We got the old truck, we drove it down, my cousin and I drove it down from Toronto. We brought it to the village, we converted it into a tank, a little tank truck, and it was our main piece of firefighting equipment from 47 up until about 51 or two, when the village saw fit to buy us a full-fledged modern, up to date with all the gadgets, fire engine built by a fire making company, I guess. And from there on, it was how do we pay for this stuff? We, there wasn't an auction sale for miles that the women of the village didn't make sandwiches, and the guys took the sandwiches to auction sales. We sold lunches. 
We held dances in the town hall. We did anything we could do to raise funds. I have a little picture here of a variety show. We had variety shows, and they got to be quite well noted. We performed in the bright lights of Sillsville one year. We took our show to Enterprise one year, and we always had a two-night stand in Newburgh. And uh, that was our sources of revenue. The women in the village would have bake sales and everything, any way to make a few bucks to buy us a coat, a pair of boots, or whatever we needed. We, we really started from the ground up. And I've always been proud of that fact that we didn't, uh, we didn't get a lot of handouts. The, the council helped us as much as they could, only having a population of, as David says, maybe seven or 800 at that time. It, it was hard to get money. And back in those days, money was, was tight. But over the years, we were able to better the equipment. We had a building given to us in 1947 when we started at the foot of the hill by Mrs. Adams. And it was a garage that she had kept her car in for many years, sold her car and gave us the building as our first fire hall. And that served as well up until 1975, when the village saw fit to build us a new fire hall, which was ultra modern and to this day is very efficient and well used by the by the guys nowadays. We have lots of equipment. Then came amalgamation that helped out financially. It helped us get more equipment to the village to serve the people. And at one point in time, we served Camden East and helped out with Yarker because their department had progressed quite as quickly as ours. And uh, we, we would go to Centerville to fires. We didn't save many houses, but we saved a lot of basements. <laughs> but we tried. And that, I've always built my whole life on, go ahead, try it, see what happens. And uh, the fire department is a prime, prime example of how you can do things if you get together and work. Over the years, the department has grown in numbers. I'm not too sure now what it is, but it's probably in excess of 20 guys. Very well trained, spend a lot of their time training because today's modern stuff is, is a way ahead of what we ever had. But again, we don't have the fires, maybe the house fires that we used to have. Our methods of heating our homes is better. Uh, we don't have the old wood stoves and the old stove pipes and the chimney fires that we used to have because most people use in the village here or on natural gas, outside the village on propane. So there's been a lot of changes over the years that has helped cut down on fire incidents, but there's still that, always that threat of something happening and God forbid it doesn't happen like it did in 1887 when it practically wiped out the village. One of the reasons the whole village didn't burn right on up to the top of the hill was many of the houses in the lower end of the village were stone. And that slowed things down. The, our town hall is a stone building, and it didn't burn. The, the uh, house next to it, the picture framing house, didn't burn because of the big stone structure. So there was a lot of things in our favor that uh, helped us get by. And uh, there have been a lot of homes in the village burned before and since, but 
not like it was even back when we formed the department. It was quite common to lose a house a year in the village. And that hasn't happened lately. And thank God it hasn't. And it's basically because of the efficiency and the training and the equipment that the township now as stone mills has been able to provide and Newburgh, we're all part of township, Stone Mills Township, and we ride on their coattails as far as firefighting goes. And in a minute's notice, they can have equipment running out your ears here. Back in our day, our alarm system was the bell on top of this church that was chimed rapidly for an in the village fire, slow toll for out of town fire. I can remember sitting in the grade 12 classroom in the high school, and whenever I heard that bell ring, I was out, I was gone on my bicycle, pedaling like crazy, hearing this slow, slow tone bell. I knew as I come down past the old cheese factory and up the hill here, I knew that the fire was out of town. Sure as hell was, it was a funeral. And they were taking the body down to put in the hearse, <laughs> chiming the bell on the bell. <laughs> I didn't go back to school. <laughs> I, I went on someplace else. But things have changed. Our, our system of alarm, we relied on the telephone operator, Lucinda Smith. She relayed calls. If you had a fire, you phoned the telephone operator. She, in turn, from Alice Milligan, who lived across the street. Alice was caretaker of the church. She'd come over and did the proper tolling of the bell to alert the firemen, which all took time, but it worked. It worked. It, it was okay. Then we got into radios, and we got into different types of alarm systems, and alarms to help uh, alert the, the people because when you think about it, this is volunteer firemen. These guys don't sit at the station and play guards until the next call comes in. They're working guys. They're, they're out of town. They're all over the place. You never know what you're going to have for a group of guys. And now in some of the stations, and I'm not too sure about Newburgh, but uh, we have some women apparently uh, that are excellent firefighters. So times change, thank God they do, and uh, I enjoyed every moment I was with the department. We all took our turn as being a chief for two years. You had your say for two years and then you shut up and went to the bottom of the heap and started over again. <laughs> and it was, it was a good system. We got along well. We would sit in that old fire hall and rip each other up and down the back. But when the meeting was over, we all walked out together because it was the grads men, the storekeepers, the people at Strathcola the paper, the Finleys were good enough at any time we needed help. We could call the mill and get guys out of the Strathcola paper that were firemen in the village. So we had a lot of support. I don't know much else I can say. If there's any questions, I... Tell about uh, when you needed, uh, needed gear, helmets and coats, and did Vernon go up from the city? Or? Well, yes. In our early years, Vernon was befriended by Fire Chief Greitman from Kingston. And he would come out and help train us. And it was just like Santa Claus pulling in with his red squad car because the trunk would be full of old, slightly overused Kingston equipment. And he would open the trunk and he'd hold something up and, here, that'll fit you. And these, be, what size are your feet? Eight, I got a pair of boots for you. And he'd come. And it was, this was a, on a, not always a monthly basis, but. He was an excellent fire chief in the city of Kingston, and he gave everything he could to help us. And uh, 
We never forgot that, never forgot it. Anything else? Anybody's got anything? Well, ben, what about memorable fires that, uh, like the biggest calls? Well, our biggest calls in, in my era was the card brush in 74 burned. That was a huge big building, frame building, three, at least three stories tall. It had been the Finkel uh, buggy and sleigh works where they made buggies and sleighs in that building. And Card Rush took it over, you say, Bev, in 30, 33. 33 as a factory to make brushes. And uh, the sales barn in 84, we lost that building. A lot of cattle were uh, burned that night. That was a, a real disastrous fire for the village because it brought a lot of people to the village. It wasn't the right spot for a sales barn, but nevertheless, it was there and it was well used and it brought in people once a week to the village to do their shopping and sell their cattle, or trade cattle or whatever went on. So we, we've had some, some big fires that... I, re I remember the sales barn fire um, and Bender's had their little kitchenette at that at that point just across the street and they had white white was it aluminum some kind of siding and in the morning the siding was all, the flames were so hot that the siding was all uh, wrinkled and rippled but then you mentioned the card brush factory which i think is a nice segue to take us over to bev toner so bev do you want to just say a, a few words and tell us about it? and maybe um locate the card brush factory for us. Okay. This is a hard to follow me. <laughs> anyway, uh, my dad, Harvey, came from Hamilton in 1932. His dad was down here. So they just, they had work with brushes in Hamilton. So they decided to see buy this building and start their own, which was beside what I call Fort the Walker Grant. Is that right, Ben? Was that? Fort Henry Grant. Well, I know it's Ford now, but who was it then? Henry Ward. Henry Ward. Blacksmith's job. Henry Ward yeah. Grant. Ford Finley's Grant. And it was next door to that. And uh, so Dad came down in 32, he played hardball with the Gibbard Intermediate B ball team. They won the championship in 34. They won another Intermediate B championship in 35. He enjoyed his baseball. He, um, I was born uh, in the stone house. What year was that? <laughs> <laughs> tell them their age, don't tell them. Don't tell them. I'm making this. Bye, Chris. You go. <laughs> you can leave now. Can I rule out of order? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to know? <laughs> I was born in 1936. <laughs> now, I'm proud. So, anyway, I'm still here kicking around. <laughs> so, it's a good party after the championship in 35. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's get back to this. <laughs> uh, I was born in the Stone House. Rick Conway owns it now. Beside the river, that's where I was born. Then in 1942, uh, Dad bought the brick house up on the South Hill. And that was a Thompson house. And that was a Thompson house, which there are five Thompson houses in the village. Thompson being 
I paid for my fare who came here and built a mill along the river where Dave Anderson lives. Apparently it was destroyed by fire, I yep. guess, at some point in time. And around the 19, early, very early part of 1900, he built the mill in Thompsonville, which today nobody knows where Thompsonville is, but it's a mile this side of Camden East. And it was, everything was water powered and uh, they generated electricity from that site. And a lot of the homes, including their five big residences in Newbury, were powered by hydro, which Napanee apparently didn't even have hydro at that time. Now, that, somebody can correct me on that one, but it, it was the source of hydro that uh, sort of helped Newbury along too in, in those days. Yeah, our house is a Thompson was a Thompson house. Dave, your house is it is a Thompson house. Spice back there. <laughs> uh, Betty Ann is uh, a Thompson. And um, Dale Knight, which I don't I think it's a fireman that lives there now. Rodney Myers. Rodney Myers. Rodney Myers, his and, on Academy up a block from Chris. Yeah. And uh, when it Winnick House across the road, and we that's the park. No. no. Oh, and Bev, mine was a Thompson house, but it was also, I get it called the old card house. Yes, my my uncle bought, Uncle Mel, yeah. he worked at the brush factory too. Yes, he bought that. So. Also, I forgot to tell, I didn't know I was supposed to talk about this, so I'm just going by my memory, which isn't good. Um, when Dad was playing his, when they won the championship uh, in 1934, um, the town of Napanee presented all the players with watches. And that watch is still as good as new. Dad never wore it. Brian had it, took it out west with him and uh, took it to a jeweler and they said that is a really good watch. He cleaned it, got it going, and it ticked right along. <laughs> so it's still going. Anyway, thanks for helping me out on the Thompson House pen. So, so anyway, the brush factory started up. They made dairy brushes and baker brushes. The baker brushes, he made, they made the baskets that were oval, and their size was 28 inches by 16 by 6 inches. And that's what the drivers, they filled their truck with I think it was a, a bakery in Kingston. I'm not sure the name of it. And then they started delivering to stores. And these baskets, which they went like that. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's how they took the bread into the stores and fill it, uh, put, the, put it on the shelves. These were just small trucks, not the big trucks that you see today. So, anyway, they made the baskets. Uh, they made the dusters, which I don't know what they would dust, but anyway, it's wired in, as you can see at the back here. This is put in a lathe, in a, what do you call it? <laughs> a bore. Uh, yeah. Something to bore a hole. To, is it? Yeah. And then they have to bore the holes. Yeah. And then they have wire, and they put the wire up through the hole, hook this onto it, and then pull it down through. That's what you call drawing? Drawing, I drawing. guess. Yeah. 
Also, they made hand brushes and dusters and brooms for the flour mill. Uh, they made milk powder brooms, which I don't know what they did, and pasteurizer brushes. They were coiled. Um, that's about what they had for the baker supply. Uh, people that worked for Dad <coughs> was Claire Rendell and I think Dorothy Conway, Dorothy Godfrey worked, and two Gary girls, uh, Herb, Herb Fenn, and there was another man that lived up the end of and Russell I, Baker. That's what it was. Russell Baker. Thanks, Ben. And Gerald Cassidy. And Bill Godfrey was a uh, cleaner. Uh, also, <clears throat> he had three or four ladies in the village and Mrs. Jerome. The, Jerome's farm was up beside Lynch's on County Road 1. And they worked out of their house. So uh, every Saturday morning, Dad and I would get in the truck. We'd take new supplies up to them and pick up what they had made through the week. And uh, in the office was Doreen Card and a lady, we called her Molly. I don't know what her I can't remember her last name. So in the, in the dairy was bottle brushes. And that's a bottle brush. This is wired in, glued in, and wired. There's wire up here. There's wire here. And this is all wire. This is for household smaller, smaller bottles. And it's used with, brought through with wire. Um, there he, they made milk can brushes. I thought I had one here. Maybe not. And they made that brooms, which is that is a vat broom to clean vats with. And that was made with the wire, but there's a top put on that you can't see the wire. Uh, they made staple brooms and floor brooms, which is this, and it has different hairs in it. It is, the holes are bored, and Dad had a, a big knife that went up like that and had a handle that come down. And he took the hair, because it came in long Skeens, supplies, skeins, 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 I guess. Skeins. And he cut to the length that he wanted. And then he would take it over and lay it in front where the girls were working. This, then he put, this is, you bore the holes to put this, and then you take your piece of hair and you wind the one end with cord, dip it in glue, and put it in the hole. And that, and it's not wired in. That's how that is is done. And and they have diff, There's different. Um, hairs in here 
because these brooms could be used at the barn, farmer's barn. They could, they're used at the dairy and they are used at the baker. And the floors were not smooth. They had bumps and that in them. So the different hairs made up that it would clean. Um, they made milk powder brooms, which I don't know what that looked like. They made curd rakes. I, had you ever seen curd rake? No, I hadn't either, but some people. <laughs> Um, Again, this fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dan. <laughs> You're boring. <laughs> um, they made curd rakes. I have no idea what they look like. But some people, I've had a couple of people tell me they've seen them. But what, whatever they were, they, you could have one row of the hair or you could have two row, whatever they wanted to buy. Um, they made flu cleaners and coil cleaners, which is these, made out of wire, and these coil cleaners. Silverwood Dairy, I don't know where it was, Peter. but Peterborough? I Peterborough. Drew, I drew milk checks. Is that right? Peter. Okay. Silverwood Dairy, they made milk can brushes and floor brushes for them. Um, that's the that. They made these brooms. And they were the same. You can see the glue has come up here. But that, that, that's not wired in. And they, they are quite stiff cleaning. This is a shoe shine brush. And this is what you put the paste on with. These are done by drilling the hole in here and crisscrossing the wire down through. And that's for it to go in uh, beside pipes or whatever needs a small space. This is a doffing brush, which Donna tells me <laughs> the right name. And it is for in the bakery when they're mixing their dough in the big vats, and then they stop it, and there's some along the rim. And so they just run that around the rim and clean, clean it off. This, I don't know what it was used for, but I, it, ha, it is tapered, so it had to go in into a small space, and this is very, very hard and tough. And it's also done by the wire. I think that's a Charlie McCarthy tooth <laughs> toothbrush. <laughs> Whatever you say. <laughs> You're a good help. <laughs> this is just another brush I brought. I don't know what it was used for, but it's also done with the wire. The holes, there's six holes drilled. And as I said, the wire comes up through. They hook that small 
piece brown and touch it in glue, put it in, but also they pull it down through with the wire. Uh, I'm sorry, they do not use glue on that one. You got me excited, man. <laughs> Doesn't take much, then. No. <laughs> And this is just another one that's done with the wire and the different uh, holes made and how they're placed and the wire is used for that. Oftentimes, Bev, I would see great big brushes, brooms for, for street sweeping. Yep. And your dad redid those or... Got yep. the old bristles out and put the new bristles in. Yep. Um, Dad made a curling brush, brush that would be as long as this table that they clean the ice with. He made it. For some reason, I don't know, he didn't donate it to the curling club, and I didn't know it was made until after he died, and I found it in the back of the closet. Anyway, I contacted Hugh Kerr, uh, a curler, and uh, I, it was donate, I donated it yeah, to the curling club. That, and that room had hangs on, on the, uh, one of the walls out of the sheets of the ice? Does it? It has a brass plaque on it, donated to the curling club. Does it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they asked how much I wanted for how much I was selling it for and I said uh, donation to the hospital so that's... Uh, also they made bottle brushes for Fuller Brush Company in Burlington they made loom dusters out of horsehair they made garage brooms which was a presume just these for the floor. They made car washer brushes. They made brewery brushes, pints, and quarts. They made uh, uh, polisher and scrubber brush machine, the machines. They made brushes for them. They made roofing brushes, the shoe brushes, they made brushes for the seed houses, seed cleaning machines, they made ring rail brushes for conveyor guides, they made toilet brushes, and they made inkling brushes that used artists use. I have one more brush that my dad made. Does anybody does anybody know the fiber? Can I, can I just take it around? And sure. Try it? Yeah. So don't. Is it your hair? Yeah. It is. Pardon? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You, you could use it for anything. <laughs> yeah, if you want to. But there is a certain line that's used for, is it? Mm -hmm. I don't use it. Yeah. It's what it's made of that's oh, of importance rather than what it was made for. Go ahead and tell us. I have a guess. Hmm? I have a guess. Yeah? Is it Mark's hair? Is it Mom's hair? Nope. No. Your hair? Your hair? Mm -hmm. Your hair? It's your hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was 13, I had pigtails had them covered since my hair was 
So when I was, uh, of course, you don't go to high school with pigtails. So I was, I was uh, going to go to the hairdresser and get them cut off. But Dad said to have her cut and keep the bind it so they don't unravel. And we brought it back to him and he laid it out on the table at the shop because when you take your braids out, it's wavy. So it had to straighten out. So it, I don't know how long it was left straightened out. And then he made my brush. Was so it I quite. That wasn't used for something or no? Pardon? Did, did you use it for something? I do not use that. <laughs> it's what year, what year would that have been? Uh, I was 13, so added up 36 and 13. <laughs> yeah. Did you Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What are the other fibers? Are there any other brushes? Do you know where they came from? Uh, actually, I don't. I know there's two different in this. You can tell by the color. And uh, I, I, I don't know where they came from. Where the fibers came from? Beth, when you were. Uh, a girl, did you spend much time at the at the factory? I, I would drop in when I was yeah. going home from school because we lived up on, on the hill. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I dropped in and uh, Dad helped me make a brush and he, my three kids, all he helped them make a brush yeah. too. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so I think that's it, David. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, Donna has a question. Yes. Uh, as things progressed, big businesses took over making brushes a lot faster and more than what card brush could make. And so in 1971, 70, 71, they closed it because they couldn't, uh, couldn't keep up with the amount that big businesses around were putting out. So so that that ended that and then the brush factory burnt in seventy four. So. And Bev you mentioned um, that they sent brushes to Silverwoods Dairy mm -hmm. in, in Peterborough and Fuller in, in Fuller. Burlington. Any how far afield do you know where, where some of the other no, products? No, that, that, all I had was the book was there, those... where they uh, sold the oh, prices okay. for. They also made like this this brush and some and these brushes. They have to have handles, which was made at the brush factory downstairs. Play on the Gibber team? Yeah. Is there anybody else? No. No. And, and uh, who owned the building after the bankles before working the car lot? The car brush? Yeah. Who was the most somebody that owned that? I don't know, Jim. Betty Ann? I mean a big brush like this. Yeah. Probably a good day, maybe. I don't know. Well, you can you move right along. <laughs> when you went to St. Jerome's to pick up what they had made mm -hmm. during the week, what would you be picking up? Brushes. Small, brushes. small, small brushes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just uh, and and they were all made with the wire. The wire was given them. They wore a leather mitt around here because the wire coming through. So there were two people at that table the brushes? I'm the, just wondering, what, how much would you have picked up each week from that household? Depends on how, yeah. 
how, they were. <laughs> how, yeah, how, how they wanted to work, but yeah, they were just put, it was just put in a box and, and new stuff was taken in. So and was it salary that they would pay them per brush? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if they wanted to be really ambitious. Oh yeah, depending on how much they wanted to make. Yeah. Who but that's... Who did the selling? Did your dad go out and... No, Mel. that was Uncle Mel. That was Mel. Yeah. And he, it went from Montreal to, they shipped to Montreal, uh, to Toronto. But every Saturday they loaded the boxes and was taken up and put on the train to go to the places. And that's why, you know, it, these big companies could do things faster than they could and, and could make them faster. Yeah, did Harper ever talk about uh, the timing that they chose to, to move the business and basically restart start the business? 1932 would have been right in the throes of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. It must have been very difficult for them mm -hmm. to get things rolling at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. No, he never, no. never said. No, they just got it up and going, and and uh, then they had to go out and sell, and that wasn't in Dad's category. <laughs> He'd rather sit up and draw brushes. So then that's when Mel came down from Hamilton, and that, that's what he did. Did your Dad's father make brushes in Hamilton before he? Yes. Did? Yeah, and then he was down here, but I don't. I don't remember Grandpa being up making brushes. He was around in the office, and he was quite an age. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was. Uh, he was getting. I remember. Up. I remember his Grandpa. Yeah, he was getting up in years. So, yeah, but he would come down when he was in the office and probably supervise everybody. <laughs> yeah. So. I can always remember going in the front portion of the card brush and that was their office and on the wall on the back wall of the office was a wooden prop from an airplane that was used in the first world war and i often wondered whether they ever had anything to do with making of propellers or it was just a novelty that was there i don't know but i can remember when the factory burned standing out in the middle of the road and watching that is that, that burn in the office i i run back home i didn't watch it <laughs> this also was made which i forgot about and it's a barber brush close um. <laughs> 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 and this was added on after the wire was drawn up drawn up and then this was put on to cover the wire. I think that's... Did they, did they, did they make uh, like uh, wooden uh, cabinetry stuff in that building also? Uh, no. You're thinking of our old yeah, sink? Yeah, I am. Chris at his house up in the corner, which was my mom and dad's, in approximately 1934, they got their first waterworks, bathroom, kitchen sink. And you could buy the cast iron sink and drain board, but you didn't get the cupboard that came underneath it. And Dad had hired your dad make the cupboard yep. that you're still using. Really? And that has to be around the 34 era because the cover of the septic tank, isn't that dated up there? Yeah. 1934? Or yeah. five or something? Yeah. yeah. So in that era, that's when that, that cabinet was made and it was made at the brush factory. Just a one off. Or just a, yeah. He was. He also made uh, toboggans oh, yeah. for us. Yeah. Uh, he made a 10 seater. That's what we had fun on. Did you ever ride it from uh, Dale Harrison's building? You're darn right, oh, yeah. right down truck, had somebody down at the yeah. corner stopping traffic, which wasn't too much anyway. And we ended up down at Fort Benning's Bridge. Yeah.
just <laughs> ten of us on there, our, their legs hooked into ours, and when we couldn't get her turn, we'd holler, lean! <laughs> He made uh, the ten-seater and he made a six-seater. And I still have the ten-seater. I don't know what it's going to probably go in a dumpster. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So. Dad also had three medals. And I think one of the boys has got them from his 1935 uh, uh, Intermediate Championship. But I think the boys have got them, so I, I don't have them. What position did he play? Dad was a pitcher, but it's not like they do now. You know, they had five days rest. And <laughs> <laughs> when you're out, you go out, you play on the field or someplace else. Yeah. But he, he was a pitcher. And he pitched for when he was had the ball teams in Newburgh when they first started. He did some pitching. But. Your dad coached me in my early years. He enjoyed his baseball. Yeah. Sports generally. Pardon? Oh yeah. 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 Harv made me a pair of water skis, a little short <laughs> pair of water skis. They weren't very fancy. <laughs> And all I wanted was something with a curve on the end, of which I couldn't make it the curve. So I went down to her. He made it, and he put those in a steamer and steamed them. And yep. Made me a, not the first set of water skis I ever had, but they were the first set of trick skis. They were only quite short, quite short skis. And where, where were you water skiing? Oh, Beaver Lake. We had a cottage for a number of years in Beaver Lake, the same site where Chris is today. Yeah, Mazinaw, we terrorized Mazinaw. <laughs> uh, ben, we've heard a bit about Bev's dad, Harv. What a, can you tell us any, anything about your parents? My mom and dad were married in 1909. And my mother was raised up on top of the hill as you go to the top of the hill and turn toward Napanee, that little white house there. She was raised there. She worked at the Thompson paper mill for part of a year or so in Thompsonville. And my sister was born in 19, uh, 1910, year after they were married. And dad married mother from that house on the hill. I married Joe, my wife, from the same house in 1959, so a matter of 50 years later. <laughs> my mom's her name? My mom's? Yeah. Anna. Anna O'Connor. Okay. And I don't know whether many of you would remember the O'Connors that lived yep. up where Aki McNichol lived north of, right by the old subway. My mom was with her mother and father in a horse and buggy. And they were, had a little farm right beside the Catholic Church going towards Centerville. There's a side road that goes to the west. And down that road, they had a, a little farm. And my mother, was with them and she would have been probably five years old. And my grandmother, whom I never saw, and, and nor my grandfather, because they were both killed in a horse and buggy runaway on the hill as you go past the Catholic Church and come toward Camden East, 
you go around a corner and up a hill. And up on top of that hill, my grandmother put up a parasol and uh, spooked the horse and the horse ran away and they were both thrown out. And I don't know how my mother, she, she was too young to know what happened, but obviously she fell out, was thrown out or something, but as close as I can cipher, that would have been about uh, 1903 or four maybe, or five along in there. How many vehicles, there were no vehicles, there were no cars, next to no cars. How long they were there? How many 18 been? How many 18 You said 19. Yeah, yeah. 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 But they were married in 09, you said. They were married in 09. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I imagine they lived there a long time before somebody came along. I bet they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mother never talked about it because she, I think she didn't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would they be attending uh, St. Anthony's home from Newport? Pardon the, him? Would that have been the church they would have gone to, St. Anthony's? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it was just down that little side road, you know, right. it goes to the west there before you get to church. It's, it's an unopened road right. down in there, yeah. So, well, first time, born in My dad was born in Newburgh here, and uh, in 1882. And in 1887, when the village burned, uh, an organization in Avenue got together and brought out clothing and, and boots and new boots to this very church and was handed out to the people that had lost everything in the fire. And my dad being five years old and with his chums came down and got a new pair of boots and took them home and he got a licking and sent back because he wasn't burned out. <laughs> So we had to raise the boot back. <laughs> <laughs> Those were. Was his dad a uh, He was, yep. yep. He had an old slaughterhouse that sat in the middle of the road down right past uh, Dennis and Mary Jo's house. And the building I have now up in my backyard is a storage shed with the old hand windlass in there to hoist up beef as they killed them. And uh, that was our slaughterhouse. We had a ice walk-in about a room about uh, six foot wide and maybe 10 feet long to hang the median and mild weather. And it was fired by ice cut from the river down uh, off just off the point of the island and you think well there's no water there but you forget breezes had a dam across that river and the river water was diverted whenever they needed into the mill pond to run the, the breezes sawmill so the water in the main river there which is now flat rock 90 percent of the time it was probably four or five feet of water in that area and it would freeze quicker there because of being shallow, I guess. And we always cut our ice there. And uh, all the stores in the village, uh, Walker's store, which is the big shop now, had an ice house. The Vandenberg store, which is the big brick building down here, was a dry goods store and a, a, a grocery store. And they had an ice house. We had uh, an ice house that would accommodate about 800 cakes of, hopefully the ice would be at least 20 inches thick, 24 possibly, and, and the cakes of the ice of ice were cut uh, square blocks, 24 inches square, packed in sawdust, and uh, they stayed all summer. And you dug them out as you need them, and 
My Saturday job was to wash those and cut them in two with a crosscut saw, wheel them down to the meat shop and carry them in and you had to go up three steps and put them up overhead in the refrigerator. And as they melted, the water was caught in a drip pan and replenished our cistern down in the basement for household water. So there was no waste. Uh, Dad uh, butchered until he was in, into his 80s, and uh, he uh, peddled meat in Newburgh, Strathcona. Uh, we had a driver, Mike Donahue, drove for us for 25 years, and he had routes in Napanee and Bath, Amherst Island, and down the uh, River Road, Little Napanee down the river road. And he had a, a, a road each each day, starting Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, four days. And uh, they killed on Monday, usually. And they would kill, depending on the time of year, whether in the fall, when the local farmers were doing their thrashing. Uh, there was a big supply or demand for for roast meats for to feed the, the crews that they used to have in the olden days of thrashing and, and you had all your neighbors help out so there was probably anywhere from two to maybe upwards of five cattle were killed weekly in the old slaughterhouse and uh, the cattle in later years, Dad used to buy them in the country and truck them home, but in later years he was able to buy them right at the sales barn and we only had to truck them over to the slaughterhouse. And that pretty well, we had uh, Canada packers came and, and brought us uh, specialty meats that uh, you had uh, of different kinds, wolf meats and head cheese and all that type of stuff. But, but basically it was local cattle killed at our own slaughterhouse and uh, sold from our little shop on a set of weight and a set of scales that I have up in my house at the moment for time. Uh, it was, it was a good business. My dad made, made a living. That's all anybody made in those days. He always had a decent car, or truck, car and truck, and uh, he, he loved to go driving on Sundays. We'd go all over the country on Sundays. And, and what was the car? Big I mean, car. What, what, what was the, his, oh, the his car. favorite car for the Sunday drive? Well. I don't know if you ever heard of Grey Dort, and uh, that was one of the early cars. Uh, Model T, of course, was, he had one of those, and uh, as years progressed, they got 36 Chev, uh, 38 Buick, uh, 50 Chev. And uh, was there a gas pump in town? There was uh, Charlie Walker's Bridge. Yeah. Uh, was had gas pumps, at, and during the war that was the only source of gas here in the village. And uh, after after the war, uh, Ford Fenwick came to the village and bought out Henry Ward's blacksmith shop, turned it into a garage and sold gas. McKeown and Wood, Jim would know dates, but. Uh, they started selling gas, I'd say, 1948 or 9, Jim? Yeah. yeah. But the village was basically self-existing. We had everything we needed. You never had to go very far. Again. We had a doctor. We had three, three stores, pregnant stores, Simpkins Brothers. Vandervoort, we had the hardware which was owned by another Vandervoort. 
grading? Egg grading station and uh, the uh, cheese cheese factory. We had cheese, all manufactured right in within our own village here. And Ben, just uh, when we were going to school up at the old academy, uh, a couple or three of us would be walking past the cheese factory and it'd be time for the curd to be finished. So we'd go up and, hi Ed, can we have a handful of chip curd? Sure, dig in the vat, get the curd if you want. That wouldn't happen today. <laughs> That's fresh curd. That's fresh curd. Fresh curd, yeah. under the vat. He never refused us if it was ready, we got it. You drink the water on a spout that you used to use. Yeah, that's yep. right. Running yeah. water. Running water. Unfailing. Stop and have a drink. <laughs> so, ben, why didn't you become a butcher? Yeah. My dad had Mike when I was young. And there, there wasn't room for three. So I guess possibly I got all the shitty jobs <laughs> at the slaughterhouse when I was young by carrying out the parts that weren't saleable and uh, rigging the hide and, and we, we sold the hides. We had to bring them home, spread them all out, sprinkle them with salt, and fold them up just a certain way. And we had an old little building and we'd pile hides in there until the the hide man came from Montreal and uh, he'd come about maybe three times a year and take a truckload of the hides away. Uh, it just wasn't room for me. And I went to school. I didn't get a whole hell of a lot of education, but I went to school. <laughs> and uh, then I started out working uh, on construction. I worked in Sudbury. I spent uh, about eight years on the ammonia plant and the terrorine plant, the construction of those two plants at Mill Haven, between 1953 and 1959, six-ish. Uh, from there, Department of Highways uh, worked on 401 construction from Odessa to 38 Highway, that stretched down through the Westbrook Swamp. Believe me, there's black snakes down there, that big ground. <laughs> and we had to wade through water up to about here. And we worked on that job for about four years. I went with consulting engineers uh, from Coburg, who uh, my brother-in-law bought out the business and eventually became, uh, it was called Totten Sims and Ubiqui at one point in time. And Lawrence never had his name on it, but uh, uh, he, he owned the business for a goodly number of years until he sold out. And then in about uh, 60, oh, 66, I guess, I decided I'd try school busing. And I bought a bus, and one led to two, to three, and at one point we had seven, but then they doubled up our, road, our loads with high and public school, which cut us back to usually around five buses. And it was okay, it was a living. That plus, I plowed the snow in the village here, I did the, repairs to the streets in the village for over 40 years. And uh, we plowed with anything from a Jeep to a truck to eventually a grader. And uh, wherever there, I got into septic tank installations. I did a lot of that. Chris is following my footsteps there. There's a living in this world if you want to work at it, but you have to work at it. I, I am a little upset with the way things are. And people don't seem to have any respect. They, they don't want to work. 
I hear every day on the news where they can't get help. I heard that Tim Hortons had to close one of their stores because they didn't have enough people to staff it when the baseball was on in Napanee. I don't know how true that was. But there's too many freebies, there's too many handouts, there's too many people living off the dole, and that can't exist, I don't think. But at my age, I'm not really worried. <laughs> As long as Joe feeds me once in a while, I, I have no complaint. Hey, Ben. Yep. Uh, I know right where the slaughterhouse was, right next to my house. Yeah. Did they hang carcasses there, or did they immediately come back up to the corner here for hanging? No, we would kill usually, like, morning. Yeah. And depending on the weather, but in the winter time, the meat was drawn over. Dad would never let meat freeze. Right. It was drawn over, he would decide, he'd look at the thermometer at 8 o'clock at night, it's going to freeze tonight, we got to bring that meat over and he'd go and bring it over. He didn't want it to freeze. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, and it was, it was all brought to our walk-in freezer. It wasn't a freezer, per se, it was walk-in cool, cool. Yeah. I feel nope. like I need to bring you to work on a Tuesday, you can give us some tips. <laughs> well, I don't know, but his theory he would never let my meat freeze. And I'm not sure why. Hard to cut. Today, every, today everybody is see it. They, they buy it, take it home, put the freezer, yeah. cook half, and freeze the rest. Ben, yes. can you talk about the times when you had to drive Dr. Mouser around? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was in the... 48, 49, 50, Dr. Mounts and doctors in those days had office hours from the time they get up in the morning until the time they went to bed. But he didn't go to bed. He'd come over at nine o'clock at night and get me, and we'd do country calls after that. And it was nothing to be in possibly enterprise. And he'd come out of a house and he'd say, I'll have a little rest. Uh, we have to go to Bath, and that would be your next tour to Bath. And I'd wake him up when they get to Bath, and I was in on confinement cases. I was in homes that I didn't know a soul in there, with a woman in the back bedroom having a baby, the doctor doing the delivering, and when the baby was born, he was as proud as anything to bring the baby out show everybody because there would be neighbor women there helping. Me sitting behind the stove, it was the middle of the winter because he was either that or freak sit at the car. And uh, I, I drove Doc for oh, three or four years. That when he was getting up in years, he, uh, he couldn't hack the, the day shift and the night shift both. He wasn't back with the driver either, was he? No, he upset a few and <laughs> ran in the, 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 his favorite thing would be he'd drive in his driveway and then he'd go back out and he couldn't back out. And he'd come over and tap on the door and, Wilfie, my dad, Wilfie, could you give me a hand? I just need a little push. And he'd start to walk over in the car and be sitting there with the back wheel going around <laughs> in the driveway. <laughs> oh, he was... He was a. He was a good doctor. Oh, he was a great. He doctor. delivered me. Yeah. Well, he, he delivered. He delivered me too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. there we are, Ben. Yeah. Both yeah. delivered. delivered him. Yeah. Who follows Dr. Bounds? Dr. Piper. Piper. Yeah. 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 That would have been mid '60s. Would it have been? I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. He deliver you, Jim? No. No. You're you're a hospital guy. Yeah. No. <laughs> you're way ahead of the rest. Of yeah. <laughs> I can remember they told me the story of sitting out there at Cooks, that you had a bad time with Dr. Ross to deliver my brother. And you I want to follow that and I'll push the sway up the hill in March. Oh yeah. 
Ja. 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 Ben, can you talk about the, tell us a story about when you helped paint the church, the Catholic church in Senegal, and what happened that day? That was a disaster for sure. They had hired, I worked for a, an elderly gentleman who would, was a painter all his life in Cambodia, Ted Delore. And each year, as soon as high school was out, Ted would be tapping at the door to get me to be with him for the summer. And we did a lot of painting in Kingston and around. We did a lot of local homes. And one of the jobs was the Catholic Church at Centerville. And I'm stuck for a date, but I, I'm thinking right around the 50s. And we were painting out there, and Ted, other years, in his younger years, and also when he would contract to paint the outside of the eaves and the fascia of the church, he would do the steeple as well. But uh, he got to the point where he wouldn't do it and he didn't have the equipment to do it with. So it was tendered out to some outfit from Hamilton, I think. And they came down and we're painting our contractors to do the eaves but nothing to do with the steeple. And I climbed up and I was painting in the eave of the west, or the north side of the church, out near the highway end of the church. And I can remember going up to the peak and looking over and seeing these guys, and there's, there's a square unit there, and then it steps in, and then there's an octagon unit where the cross is in the middle of that, up higher. These guys were up there and they were driving in spikes and standing on them and hanging on to another one and painting with a stepladder to help them. And when I looked up, one of the guys was sitting there with his back against the stepladder, holding it up while his buddy was up painting. And I just climbed down and started painting again and I heard this crash and the stepladder went right down over my head. And I thought, that doesn't sound good. And I looked up and there was nobody there. And I came down and ran around to the front of the church. And they had both fallen about between 60 and 70 feet. Uh, they were both alive when we scraped them up. We loaded them into an old van and told them where the closest doctor was. Phoned an ambulance, which I guess met the, the doctor's office here. I wasn't in on that. But uh, one guy lived, I think, two days, and the other guy lived about a week. But they both died from that. Uh, there was, they tried to sue the church, but it was a cut and dry contract. But fortunately, the church wasn't liable. But it was uh, an experience that I didn't need, but I got it anyway. Can I talk about the Stanley's father? Pardon? Talk about the Stanley's father? Yes. Yeah, Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Ted. Yeah. Yeah, he had uh, two sons and a daughter, did they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stan and Bernie and uh, the daughter. Betty. 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 Yeah. They lived right for Larry, or where uh, McCormick's. Mike McCormick's building is. There was a big old hotel there, a big old white frame hotel. And uh, they lived in that. And then uh, Larry McCormick bought it, tore it all down, and uh, that was after the Alors had died off. And started his first uh, McCormick's store. It was a barbershop, wasn't it? No, the barbershop was on the other corner, kitty corner. And who had that? Uh, Clarence Bolton. Bolton. 
first guy to cut, cut Chris's hair. Yeah, well, I, uh, he was the first he cut Brian's hair. Yeah. <laughs> Brian used to call him Bobo. <laughs> cut Bobo, Bobo. Chris doesn't have quite as much to get cut in one. He's smart. Yeah. 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 Always a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure whether we're taking up a lot of people's time or we just visited. <laughs> there David, we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> You're very kind. Of, I think if there's, uh, I, yeah, I can. Ben, I was told that the Switzerland Church originally was repurposed here in Newburgh as a, a warehouse or something, uh, storage of some kind. Never, and never that I can recall. I remember the Switzerland Church until they tore it down. Well, when they tore it down, I was told it was that could well have been, but I, I'm not aware of where it went or who well, did it. Or the reason I ask is that I've had people come to say that it was then moved up to the top of the hill, and so it's it's 200 years old parts of it. Um, and it was moved to where? To, to uh, Clarkland Farms, at the top of the hill. To across from the coast. Yeah, Clarkland. <laughs> no, across from Walworth. Walworth, yes, thank I'm going to say no, but I... Yeah, okay. I, 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 I really don't know. I, I don't know that... It was a brick... Was it not a brick church? No. The, the next one was... The original one was 1826. I wasn't around. <laughs> That's why I don't remember. I'm old, man. I'm old. You got to draw a line someplace. Well, Walrus owned that property forever and a day. Mm -hmm. John Walrus and his sons. And they could well have taken portions of the original church. I, I, would, I would not know. I think if it were done, they were done prior to my 1931 model. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't know. So with that, let us conclude this first session and I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks Donna for organizing this and uh, thanks especially to Bev and Ben. So thank you. We hope you We hope to do uh, more of these, maybe even one a month. So, uh, <laughs> brush up, Beth. <laughs> anyway, no. I can't beat him. Okay. Um, but I think as, as you're leaving, if you want to pass by the, the desk here, there's some beautiful brushes and, and photos and trophies and things. So, thanks again for coming and uh, see you soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks for putting up with us. <laughs> We tend to ramble. Yeah. Yeah. I want to tell you, my dad was in the brush business too. And I, when I was a little guy, I spent so much time in the brush factory. And when I looked at the brushes, and you tell your stories, the smell, you remember the smell of the blue? You probably remember that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a special smell in the factory. There is. And uh, their business was more. We put on these variety shows. We had I was close to someone when I was a young lad. My name was Mark. I played in the town. Yeah. Robert was not just a girl. Yeah. 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 Yeah.